Hi, this is Peter Montoya, speaker, author, thought leader, and tech entrepreneur. Today, I'll be talking about the Second Civil War. In our conversation today, we'll talk about how to handle political conversations in the civic arena and also at work. Secondly, we'll talk about how you can actually disengage from the Second Civil War. And then finally today, we will also, I will also give you the most controversial advice you've ever heard regarding your political life. Stay tuned. Welcome back to our delicious conversation with Peter Montoya. Peter Montoya. Peter is a thought leader, skilled orator, orator a tech entrepreneur, a successful business strategist, um, he has started his own companies, grown those companies, sold those companies. Um, he's building a game-changing tech startup called Earth E. Uh, it's not the usual Earth, but U R T H. We're going to talk a little bit about that, what that actually is. And he is the author of a brand new book called The Second Civil War: A Civilian's Guide to Healing Our Fractured Nation. And it was released on August the 3rd of 2021 and immediately became a bestseller. And we were talking about in the past, uh, in part one, about how uh, this is a really, really important subject. And yet, guess what? He's not getting on national media. He's not getting on the, uh, the, the Foxes and the MSNBCs or you know either side of those because they like the adversarial nature. It gets people watching. It appeals to the limbic brain. It appeals to the part of our brain that likes a good fight or likes to watch a good fight. And this is about a solution book. This is a book about how to actually heal that fracture and bring us back together. So I want to I want to talk about that a little bit, about that sort of not wanting a solution. Talk to us a little bit about what that's like for you. You've written this wonderful book. It is a great book. I've endorsed it. Um, it's making a, some very good and important points. Talk to me about what I can. I can only imagine the frustration of saying, "Dude, here's what you do," and they're going, "No, no, we, we we're enjoying a good scrap. Piss off. Come back later." Yeah. So you know, there's one part of frustration that I have. Uh, that I want to get my my message out as any author does. And of course, your book is is, is your baby. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so that's the kind of uh, passion I have and interest I have in it. But the bigger frustration that I have is realizing the deplorable state of much of our media. So when I say media, let me make sure I'm defining that. Media means uh, any cable, any internet, uh, TV, radio, podcast, mm. magazine, newspaper. So when I say media, I'm not just talking about the big five or seven major networks. I use the word media very, very broadly. Yep. Now, not all media is bad. Not no. all media is bad. But a lot of media has basically, basically figured out the following formula. They've figured out the best way to get more attention or to get more eyeballs is through conflict. And so what they've figured out is they have become outrage driven advertising machines. Mm -hmm. The more alarmed and scared we are, the more attention we give those networks, the more advertising they sell and the more stock prices, their stock price goes up. And you're, I think probably at this point going, Peter, are you suggesting that the news media is literally making billions, if not trillions of dollars, dividing Americans? And that is exactly how deplorable and immoral what they're doing is. It is naked. It is open, out to the open. Uh, and all of us know it. So my, I'll give my first recommendation here. And my first recommendation is this, is never, ever pay any attention to any either uh, media personality, politician, or a uh, media channel that demonizes uh, another American or another group. Now, I'm all for attacking ideas. This is a marketplace of ideas. We've got freedom of speech, attack ideas all day long. But anybody who is getting more attention by attacking Americans uh, is inherently hurting our country and our ability to cooperate and solve our national problems. So I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and you're absolutely right that that is the machine. Uh, we, 
even I can remember, even in the late eighties, the 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 language was if it if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. And you know now bleed it just means outrage the more outrage you can create the more attention you'll get and again we're back to that limbic system fight or flight and all those things are going on um tell us a little bit about uh u-r-t-h <laughs> thank you i think this is the first a uh, chance i've had publicly to talk about it so that the in my view um the biggest challenge with the social media platforms and i'm on an, a number of them uh, and yeah. i really have, have enjoyed myself but the biggest challenge with me, social media networks right now is bots um, trolls and misinformation and all the major networks are trying to figure out how to reel in this problem. Mm -hmm. What it turns out is, is all of the content moderation systems they've been building, all the systems that do, uh, do sentiment analysis to say, okay, this is actually a positive or a negative or hateful or obscene, yep. those things are completely imperfect. They do a really, really lousy job. They will never, ever be as good as other human beings are. So we naturally uh, have the ability to create context. So mm -hmm. there are times, uh, for example, uh, I love a TV show, which is really rather profane called It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And I belong to a member page um, on Facebook that regularly quotes that TV show. And the quotes are awful. They are terrible. However, in the context of that TV show, they're relatively civil because this is how they communicate in this context and everyone knows it's it's satire however those comments put on another page somewhere would be incredibly uncivil yes. so the social media platforms don't have a way of doing that but human beings do right so the two biggest solutions we've got the first one is user authentication we make sure that everybody on the system is actually a human being Mm -hmm. uh, the reason that's so important is this is uh, freedom of speech is one of our most sacred rights I sincerely believe that but very similar to how you made an analogy earlier about the founding fathers and using muskets our founding fathers never imagined that a person's freedom of speech would be disembodied from their identity Yes. Technology didn't exist back then for that. No. Nope. So they always assume when someone was speaking that their identity was attached to it and therefore they had reputational risk. Mm -hmm. There is less or if no, no, let's say a lot less reputational risk right now on social media because you can create an avatar. Uh, yes. You're not responsible for what you say. And that's one of the reasons there's so many bots and misinformation. So that's the first thing we do to help curtail that problem. Uh, and the second thing we do is we created a social network that actually rates civility. So something that you might say among one group of friends that might be profane somewhere else, that group knows. <laughs> Just like when you hang out with your buddies uh, and you might be telling dirty jokes, well, in the context of hanging with a bunch of guys, that's actually civil. But at the yeah. workplace, it's not. And right. so people do a really good job of that. And we're building a network that will help create the right uh, moderation depending See, on, I, on, on where you are the reason i wanted to ask you about that is exactly that because i've said that in the age of social media you know you and i know we've all heard this content is king and i've always said yeah it was in web 1.0 now it's not now because content is ubiquitous mm -hmm. it's everywhere mm -hmm. and most of it's crap anyway Right. So content is not king. What I believe is king is context. Um, but most people are jumping over context in order to puke out more content. And so this idea of creating something that gives context, because, you know, my wife and I were sitting around the other day and we were talking about something and we were remembering a movie we love that we watched together and that we had the boys watch when they were like nine and 10 and the boys walked around saying the lines from the movie. Right. right? And, and the, the, the movie was called the party with Peter Sellers, right? Peter Sellers was a white Englishman playing in playing an Indian movie star who arrives in Hollywood. Right. Right. And, you know, and he uses the, an Indian accent and, and, and he's, and he's shaking hands with a guy in a cowboy hat and he's saying, how do you do the partner? Right. You know, and it's hysterically funny, right? Airplane, the movie, is really funny. 
all those movies are really funny. You can't have them today because somebody's going to be offended because there's no context and it's destroying, uh, in my opinion, one of the great arts, which is comedy. Mm. Uh, so having something that allows us to ask what's the context, mm -hmm. not just what's the content, because Andrew Cuomo, clearly there's a lot of evidence that guy's done a lot of bad shit. And okay, you know, the evidence has come out. But without the other part, which is, as he said, he naturally hugs people. He naturally, I believe him. He naturally hugs people. He naturally kisses people. You know, he naturally is that way. The spillover is where one line ends and the other line begins is in context. Like, so was he contextually being, being a, a, a grubby old guy kissing people no in that context he was just being a friendly person who is italian and kisses and hugs people i do too i'm european and in another context you know i also grab people's asses but they are usually my mates <laughs> they're my friends because right. we do that right i you know i don't do it so much anymore but we used to also sack each other and it wasn't about anything else it was a context like you said about dirty jokes this is to me the element of what we're losing here and so I'm really fascinated by your solutions moving forward about bringing context back. Because for me, that is the key. When I say, uh, I believe curiosity is the cure for the world, what it's saying is be curious rather than assumptive. What does that mean? It means what's the context? Mm -hmm. Be willing to say, well, what's your context here, mate? Oh, I get it. You're a racist, Dick. That's fine. And now I understand. And I don't want anything to do with you. But now I know. Or, oh, that was not, there was nothing racist about where you were coming from in context. Could you have said it better? Probably. Do you need to say it better? Likely. But there's a context. So I'm really interested in your solution around this with what you're doing with URTH. Uh, um, Earth is the right way to pronounce it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure because naturally people will want to spell it the other way. Um, so is this is this a platform for people to come together and share ideas, but in the, sorry, in the context of context? Yes. So yes, I, it is exactly that. Whereas most social media net networks go out of their way to promote the ideological extremes, uh, we have created an algorithm that promotes uh, the unifiers. So who are the people who have <clears throat> new solutions, who have new ideas that say it in a civil manner that appeal to the broadest audience, that's what our algorithm actually promotes. And uh, I agree that context is really important. And I would also say this, the, the king used to be, you know, creating just massive amount of content. I, I think the new king today, or what I think it should be is reputation. So mm. uh, in, the, in the real world, it's all about reputation. You know, mm. How many days, how, many, how much content have you created in a way that is uh, with good intent, that has attempted to be honest and fair and objective and civil? And there's a whole sea of that and making sure that people who actually have all that kind of history of, have, have the better reputations and then their messages are more likely to get amplified uh, as a unifier and as a thought leader. But now we're back to the same thing, which is the, the fragility on both sides. People say, oh, the woke are all too fragile. Yeah, you know what? The other side is just as fragile. Mm -hmm. They're fragile about being any comment against them. So I, I think it's, so you're now at this place, which is, well, that's not civil. <laughs> so I'm in the middle and I go, well, that's very civil. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, well, I'm, a, I'm over here. I'm a hard left or I'm hard right. And I think it's very uncivil. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. So one of the, we are actually a civil media platform versus a social media platform. And the major distinction is this, is social media is about um, a, both a popularity and sensationalism. And mm. a civil media platform is more about reputation uh, and actually, uh, yeah, about reputation. So I would say that LinkedIn 
is much more of a, of a model of a reputation network. They do a much mm. better job of not just saying, hey, it's sensational, it gets lots of likes. It's, is it true? Is it honest? Um, and the like. And so that's what we want to reward. Second thing with a several media platform, a social media platform, uh, everyone's invited. You know, Facebook is wants you know, 2 billion, 3 billion, 5 billion um, members. And a civil media is a lot more um, discretionary, which means okay. that we, you have to apply to be part of our network. <laughs> and, it, and so if you're applying for it, you understand that there's actually rules, a good community, always good communities that create some kind of barrier to entry. Uh, and it's achievable usually, but the barrier to entry is really important because once you're beyond the barrier, you feel safe. Yeah. You usually behave better. So when you're in the wild west of most social media platform, there's no barrier to entry and people behave terribly. Uh, in a civil media platform, you got to apply. You have a, a trust score that's created over time. Uh, and then also, I don't think we're going to appeal to the extremes. They, they, they just won't come on our network. And that's okay with me. That's great. That's wonderful. So let's talk about that's a platform. And then the reality, the, the workplace, the mm. reality of the workplace. So how do we create a civil environment in the workplace when the people, the 67% who stand in the middle um, are also usually much quieter mm -hmm. and the, the, those on the fringes are the, now the ones with the megaphones. Mm -hmm. um, those, that world has changed. It used to be the other way around. But now it's, it used to be like, oh, shut up, you're crazy. And like, that's fine. Go talk about that with your crazy uncle, but not here. But now it's reversed. So as leaders listening to the show, watching us, who are saying, this is great. I love the idea of this platform. I, I agree with what you guys are talking about. But how do we do that here? How do we do that in myabcinc.com or you know whatever it might be? How do we do this with our people? in our culture, how do we do that? It's, it, it's a great question. So uh, most books on politics are kind of theoretical and they're mm. rather descriptive. They say, here's, we're describing what's happening right now in politics. Uh, and my book is uh, actually very practical. It is prescriptive, which means it teaches people how to and why, uh, how to and why to have civil conversations. So the book is meant to be very, very practical. I. I Initially, I had a hard time booking speaking engagements for corporations because they all said, we don't touch politics. Uh, and then once they saw the presentation and they understood, oh, this is nonpartisan, it's apolitical, and explains to us what we're doing so we can stop doing it. Because once the people see the, the way that our, our brains work, how we're actually these incredible incredibly tribalistic creatures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> once we see that we actually agree on 70 to 80%, once we see the unbelievable futility of it, once we're explained that, we can actually overcome uh, our tribalistic instincts. This is one of those circumstances that oftentimes is to identify it and to name it, uh, usually neutralizes it. So, okay, but I need the practicality of that. So now we've got you know, I, I've got this company, let's say, let's use a simple number, easy number, 100 employees. Um, there are the whisperings of this cold civil war going on inside of the organization. I'm terrified it's going to tear my company apart. Uh, what do I do? Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's probably a bad idea. Uh, and it's happened a couple of different places where they completely ban uh political expression inside the workplace that does not seem to be, I understand no. why they've done that. Yeah. Uh, but probably the best part is training, which is what you and I do on a regular basis is we train people once again, uh, how to have civil conversations. So if you're going to decide to have a political conversation, if you decide you're going to do that, here are a couple things, approaches you can do. Uh, the first one would be is to frame the conversation. And here are some framings that I use on a regular basis. Uh, discussion uh, is better than debate. Uh, people debate to figure out uh, what is, uh, I'm sorry, who is right. And people have discussions to figure out what is right. Mm -hmm. So that might be one of the first tenets. Second tenet right. of a really good frame conversation is say the following. 
I'm not here to change your mind. Please don't change mine. I'd love to hear your point of view uh, and I'd love to be able to share mine. It's another great tenet to having now an empathetic conversation. Uh, and the third one probably is around uh, tone, volume, and language. <laughs> and that we always may want, not just the words we use, it tone and volume are as or more important than the words we use. So that's the first thing I will tell people if they're gonna have a political conversation, here are some frameworks to having a civil conversation. Okay, so, but in a practical sense, uh, let's say they, they decided that they're not going to hire Peter Montoya or Dov Barron to help them with that. Um, do they organize a town hall? What do they do? Yeah, I can, I can, uh, you know, I, I've been really surprised as I'm sure you have too. these last 18 months. I, uh, previous to that only thought that in-person training was the only way to do training. And what I've been absolutely amazed of is how effective a uh, zoom or any kind of virtual training is mm -hmm. i'm getting as good of a training result uh via zoom uh, as i used to in person have you had that same experience too Dolph? Yeah, from them for me it's weird because i like the feedback loop yeah. i like to be uh, you know it's hard for me because i i enjoy watching and seeing mm -hmm. and and that's yeah. gone that kind of sucks for me but for them, they seem to be like getting tons out of it. Yeah. So you can't, I can't argue with that. <laughs> that was my experience too. And I, yeah. and I you know, I, I, I really ask that everyone puts their cameras on so I can see faces and I still can read the, 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 the room, not yeah. as well as in person, but I've been yeah. really surprised by that. Yeah. And so, yeah, I would take uh, some of the content out of my book, uh, create some slides on it. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll create a, a slide deck that corporations can download and actually give without me being there. And maybe I'll create a video too. See, I'm getting ideas right here on the spot as we go here. Good. I have a political conversations at work and what's a good idea around a uh, conversation. So I'm mean, going to look to my website for that one. It may be, uh, maybe ready <laughs> within just a couple By of the weeks. time this is released. Right. Yeah. That's great. So putting all this into, into context of, from what you're seeing as you look at the political climate, um, and by that I don't mean Democrat versus Republican, I mean, you know, the national uh, sense. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you see a turnaround or do you think it's going to get worse before it gets better? Uh, if, gosh, it is a, a really good question. So the question, here's, here's the question I would ask is what is the what are the, what are the dividing lines and where is the battlefield mm -hmm. so you actually did a really great job um, earlier discussing about what the battle line was around the first civil war which was around uh, slavery and versus federal versus state powers and that was what the yep. first civil war was about what is this second civil war about uh, right. there's a couple different ways of arguing it here's how i would this is a very broad statement it's about which version of reality you believe uh, yep. And then, you know, if you don't believe that reality, the civil war is about, I can't get along with the other side. The other side is insane. Mm -hmm. So there really is not an issue. I mean, a, a clear cut, one singular issue. It is, I disagree with your version of reality and you are insane. Uh, I can't go on living in this country with you is probably the first way of kind of dividing the civil war. And then the next question is, well, where's the battlefield? Mm -hmm. And the battlefield is not out in uh, Gettysburg. Yeah, that's exactly it. it. It's in our brains. Yeah. So the, the, the question is, well, if it's in my brain, that's where the battle's being waged, you have the ability to opt yourself out of that mm -hmm. war at any time you choose. So what partisans will say is, well, I will only change when the other side changes. And what leadership guys like you and I say, Dov, is you can't change the other side. All can you can do is change yourself. yourself. Yeah. And the second you decide that this civil war is being manufactured and that you're not going to be a victim to it anymore, that's the day the civil war ends for you. That's a great point. So what got you to this point with yourself? Because I, I, I've said from, you know, I talked about even in, in our intro, 
you know, you've got this wonderful history of how you've come up and what you've done. But I always say success is not point A to, to Z. It's not how it works. It's a very twisted turn. And oftentimes there is a turning point. There is this dramatic thing that makes us realize I'm off course. I got to change course. Mm. What was that for you? Oh, that's a, a great question and a very painful uh, answer. So I, I was deep in the second civil war. I was really, really deep in it. And I was really, really angry at anybody who was on quote unquote, the other side. Yeah. Uh, and then one of those people was my father-in-law and my father-in-law distributed an email promoting his side, you know, his, sure. his side there. And I replied back with a horrific, snarky, sarcastic, awful, terrible, shameful reply where I was trying to shame him for his political choice. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in the moment when I wrote it, I thought I was completely and totally justified. I thought righteousness was on my side. And about a day later, he didn't reply back. Uh, I was going back and I'd read it again. And I was like, what in the world am I doing? Why did I send this? This is not who I am. Why mm -hmm. do I respond this way? So what started this journey for me was to answer that question because I know better. I have no more of a monopoly on reality than anybody else does. I'm as delusional, as tribal, and as flawed as anybody else on the planet. This book started with that realization and that awful, terrible thing that I did to figure out why I did it. And that's what began me reading uh, books after books after books, a, a lot on uh, Evo Psych, evolutionary psychology, and then also about politics too. You know, I really appreciate you sharing that, Peter. I think it's vital for people to know that, that there will come a point where you will have to decide. You'll have to decide if this, whatever this is, is you. Mm -hmm. If this backing this person or this group or whatever it might be is that representative of you you know and and i'm very clear uh in my assessment of it uh, i studied cult psychology for a long time we are living in cult psychology today a lot of the stuff you, we talked about here today on the show in part one and part two is is embedded is deeply marinating in in cult psychology and we're not responding to each other in any other way than that is and that is you're in our cult our group and you're wonderful and we love you mm -hmm. you're not in and we don't now there is a middle ground and that is the middle ground is we can persuade you to come into our cult right and we'll be nice to you until you do but once you're in you'll follow all the rules and even if you disagree and, you know, we saw that with some of the interviews of people who marched on, on January 6th. They were like, what did I do? I've seen that with some of the people who were marched with Black Lives Matter and realized, hold on a second. These people are not what I thought they were. I was marching because I really believe in civil rights. And that's not what it was about. And so these people are questioning. And I think that more than anything, if, you know, what what I, what I used to uh get people out of cults and do that work. And, and part of it was to teach people how to question. And everything that's been going on has been saying, don't bother questioning. You just need to know we're right. Mm -hmm. And, and, but I love the, what you brought up as a point, which is you, you will find yourself. I mean, obviously as you're watching, listening, this, you can see that Peter is a highly intelligent man who's had a lot of success in the world. This is not some schmucko from, from the corner, you know, who's never had a decent job or never read a book. I mean, never had any decent relationships. This is a highly educated, insightful human being who realized he was behaving like a tribal lunatic and went, oh, is that who I am? No, and put the brake on and decided to look inwardly. And I really appreciate you sharing that because it would be easy not to share that and just be on the high horse. But I, you've heard me say this a million times in these shows. All your growth comes from your pain, confronting that pain, addressing that pain. Like, just like, hold on a second. This is so painful. It's telling me something. What is it? 
Is, is it that I hate my father-in-law and he's an idiot? Or is it that I'm behaving like a stuck in the mud, righteous person? So I really appreciate you sharing that, Peter. Thank you so much. As we come to the end of the show, there's two things I want to ask you. Again, I want to ask you to make sure that people know where they can find out about you and about the book and all your resources. But the other thing I want you to, I want you to leave everybody with a, a sort of little gem of, of action. Mm -hmm. right? You know, you talked about love being a verb. So some action here that people can take away and apply to integrate what you've been sharing because information is worth the hole in the donut. Transformation comes from the application. What can we do now, immediately, five minutes from now, certainly within the next 24 hours to integrate what you talked about? I'll give you one more. And that is to, and this is very controversial. People don't like this advice. And that is fabulous. To, <laughs> my favorite kind. <laughs> disavow your political party fil affiliation and, and become independent. Uh, and I was um, a member of a party. And mm -hmm. what I thought at the time when I remember was a member of the party is I thought that it was the other, the other party was much uh, more deceitful and less trustworthy. But what I discovered was my party lied to me. Um, and when I realized that uh, the most deceitful party is not the other party, the most deceitful party is the party that you're a part of. You don't trust the other party. You right. trust the party that you're in. And so that basically gives a super highway for that party and all of the ecosystem to plant ideas in your brain that may not be true. So when you become independent and you put the country first, you say, I'm an American, I might lean left or lean right, but I'm an American first. It gives you an extra level of humility and also skepticism to say, is this really true? <laughs> Do I really believe this information is being fed to me? Because as soon as you say, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm a socialist, I'm a communist, I'm a libertarian, it is basically like saying, just pump me through of every idea and I will not question it, I'll question it a lot less. So that would be the advice I would give you. Everyone hates that advice. Uh, you still came by the way. You can still vote on both sides. You can still give money on both sides. I'm just talking about a psychological technique of thinking of yourself as independent and American first. Uh, go fight for ideas, go argue for ideas, but just do so with an extra layer of objectivity and skepticism. I personally love that advice. I don't hate that at all. I think it's fabulous guidance and it's and it's important guidance because of exactly what you just said because it gives you healthy skepticism and let me be clear that skepticism is misunderstood mm -hmm. this is not pessimism or cynicism right. or cynicism. cynicism it's not right. cynicism it's just cynicism give me a, a, a commiserate a level of evidence to the claim that you're making Exactly. I, I'm willing to, to pay attention. I'm willing to listen to the evidence and I'm willing to be moved in either direction. And by the way, skepticism is the foundation of science, just so you understand. Yep. It's not that I, uh, I don't think you're right. It's not that I think you're wrong. It's like, where's the evidence that this is the way to go? And skepticism, you know, and by the way, is also the foundation of all of business <laughs> exactly you get those spread reports a spreadsheet you spend a it's me give one last note here every single book on leadership creative problem solving every time you want cooperation it all begins with the same thing a common understanding of what reality is that is skepticism all business starts with skepticism wonderful Thank you. Please tell our audience where they can find out more about you, the book, and all the other wonderful things, of course, including Earth. Oh, of course, you can find me at petermontoya.com, and I do regular Zoom meetings just like this for corporations. And if you listen to this interview, you see that I'm completely non-political. I'm non-partisan. I just speak about the human psychology and how we can cooperate better together. That's what I want to have happen at the corporate level. On the national level, I want us cooperating. And also you can find my book, which again, non-partisan on barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. Thank you for asking, Doc. And, and what about Earth? Oh, yeah, Earth very soon. You can find our website, which gives you a preview. It's really just a glimmer right now at U-R-T-H, Earth, U-R-T-H dot media, dot media.
dot media okay u r t h dot media hey of course we will make sure that all those links are put into the show notes so that you'll be able to track them and find them and i do encourage you to read the book it is a great book and as peter said it is totally nonpartisan this is not about who's right or who's wrong it is about having the healthy skepticism that will allow us to look at each other with empathy and compassion and find a way to come together uh, and not really be arguing for who's right or wrong, but really for what's good for all. So I encourage you to read it. Again, I want to thank Peter. Thank you, Peter, for being with us. It's been a pleasure and an honor. And for you, dear listener, remember that you can hang out with other conscious leaders. You can chat about this episode that you've been listening to or any past episodes on inside of our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go look for the Leadership and Loyalty podcast. The truth of the matter is it doesn't matter how successful you are. If your employees and your customers don't understand what gives your company meaning, you're only working at a fraction of your true capability. To find out how you can hire me, Dov Barron, as a speaker or a leadership strategist for yourself or your organization, simply go to dovbaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. Because unified, actualized meaning is the one single monolithic difference between greatness in individuals and companies. I want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about where the true middle ground is. It's in your head. Where the battlefield is taking place is in your head. You can cancel the battle anytime you want and decide to look at the people around you as friends, as neighbors, and as fellow patriots, even if they don't agree with you. I'm Dov Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deepest meaning to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.